Well, once again, a very good morning to everybody and indeed good morning and welcome to uh, all cross-country fans across the United Kingdom, in, especially those up in uh, Huntley, the ski club that, <coughs> excuse me, is very much uh, home also to the likes of Andrew Musgrave and also Andrew Young. Andrew Musgrave in today's uh, lineup, and uh, as you would imagine, it's a pretty big field, 76 competitors from 20 nations. It's not only about the World Cup today, it's an opportunity to really uh, try and test yourself out for next year's Nordic Ski World Championships. Mike Dixon alongside myself, David Goldstrom, and there you can see the start list. Of course, it's a mass start, as Petter Nortug was just explaining. And Mike, just to once again uh, go over the situation, um, the servicemen, they said this morning before the women's race that the snow falling and the zero temperature made it quite tricky for the classic legs. And also, this is no easy track. It's no easy track, and you need grip. You cannot propel your body in the classic style. It, unlikely anyone's going to double pull it. It's not going to happen in these conditions. So you need get grip. Of course, Callum Smith as well, uh, 75 from the Huntley Club racing today as well. Um, so it, it has been a difficult today. I've noticed the snow is falling much slower. Therefore, it's a drier snowflake now. So we've got a slightly colder temperature. But I've also noticed most of the competitors are are going on the skin skis, waxless skis, is like a mohair base on in the waxing pocket. And that gives you your grip on the uphill climbs. So the overall World Cup leader, Martin Jonsrud, somebody as dominant in his division as Teresa Johaug is in the women's division. Nicholas Derhaug of Norway and then Maurice Magnificat. Interesting, uh, Maurice, uh, who uh, rested out last weekend in Falun and therefore might be fresh here. And this will be interesting to see Sharota, who uh, can be very effective. You can see the guys are really wrapped up here. It's one of, it, it, The humidity is actually uh, uh, better now than it was for the women, but it's not the most, un uh, most comfortable of winter days. Six there, Alexander Legkov, the champion of the Olympic Games over 50 kilometers. He's been knocking on the door. Interesting, the Russians have been getting their uh, ski preparation very well organized in the last couple of weeks, and I expect the uh, Russians to be there. There's uh, De Fabiani. This is the man who, uh, well, you just saw him momentarily, the man who leads the under-23 rankings. Eight, Finhagen Kron, nine, Hans Christian Holland. All the stars are there. Peter Nortug wears 10 today. Verleg Janin, who won the world title, he wears bib number 11, 12 is Best Mertnik. There's an awful lot of Russian contenders up in the front order of this race. Matti Heikkinen of Finland, who looked as if he was finding a bit of form last weekend in uh, Falun. He's wearing bib number 13. Uh, Jean-Marc Gaillard, another man who we should... Uh, keep on the right side of. So here we go, 70 com 76 competitors coming under starter's orders. So the clock at quarter past 12 in Lati and well, the habit these days is to hold the athletes as long as possible, but that was much better than it was earlier in the day. Mike Dixon together with myself, David Goldstrom. The journey is 30,000 meters. The first 15,000 in Stride and Glide Classic. The second 15 in freestyle skaters. They pile out of the Lati Stadium into the first of the uncomfortable uphills, oh. and we've got carnage. Oh, skis off, that is a mess. Didn't oh. expect that. Uh, hobbling there, uh, oh, no, not injured, he's got no ski on. I thought he was injured there. That'll be appearing on a Watts program near you. <laughs> Look and at carnage, as you say, ski poles broken and skis coming off. Don't often see the skis coming off. Yeah, but it didn't happen up the front there, so you were on towards Sunby and then followed by Dirhag, then Maurice Magnificat. And now uh, over to Mike on a recap uh, of a couple of really important points. So, Mike, uh, the question for the women was to wax or not to wax. 
and also uh, this particular track which is one of the tougher ones it is one of the you hug said it in her race she loves steep hill climbs well, let's have a look at the the mess at the start here surprised it happened because there's enough tracks but when one man goes down it's uh, it's just a, a pile of cards falling over isn't it and yeah. they, they with those two meter skis two groups of uh, fallers and there's not much you, you cannot do anything about that if you're skiing into that mess so uh, very easy out the front uh, huge climb on each of these uh, sections uh, some 800 meters uh, climb in the first 15 kilometers and the second 15. i think seeing most of the athletes running to the start line it looks like uh, the skins or the waxless option which has got this little mohair grip section built into the ski that appears to be the favorite for most today they haven't risked uh, the, the clister, which with the drier snow falling now would, would tend to ball up, ice up, and really restrict your glide on the skis. So it's a real difficult day when you're around these zero temperatures. And Mike, also, there's an altitude difference in terms of temperature. There is. Uh, in the stadium, the low point is the stadium. You're climbing up uh, in the men's race nearly 62 metres to the high point, and that's almost a one degree shift in temperature. And, uh, and therefore, what's good in the stadium area isn't always good when you're putting the traditional old waxes on. You can slip or you can overgrip. It's, it's a, a real science, and when teams employ 15 people to get it right, that is how, how important the waxing is in these races. So not surprisingly, it's Martin Jonsrudsenby who, like Teresa Johar, perhaps not in quite such an exaggerated uh, style, uh, loves to lead the races, and very conscious of the fact that the more points he gains, not only the points for the race, but the bonus sprint points that are involved in this competition as well, not on this first rotation, but remember, they've got four rotations of 3.75 in classic, and then four again in uh, freestyle. And uh, Pedro Nortug uh, sitting in the uh, middle of the front half of the pack there. And I think he's going to be a hunter uh, today. And these conditions, I think, will suit him. And uh, as he said in his pre-race interview, uh, he's had one eye on this race for a while. He even said that about the sprint yesterday. Even when he was racing in the sprint, he had... And the sprint takes a lot of energy out of you four times around the 1.5 kilometer track yesterday. He said he had a little part of his mind was on tomorrow, on this moment. So I think Pedro Nortig will be a threat today. Yeah, sadly, uh, Dario Colonia still sidelined, but of course, hoping to be back for Canada after his uh, renewed physical problems with the strained calf that really forced him out of racing. And uh, he said when he suffered that uh, injury during the Tour de Ski that he had suffered that sort of injury in summer training, but never in the winter. Such a pity. And, and at that point, when that injury occurred, he, he was at the front of the pack with five, having completed 10 kilometers with five to go and the second last day of the Tour de Ski. And the Tour de Ski, uh, certainly where Jonsrud Sunby has made hay and that he's built up uh, a huge amount of his advantage by winning yet again the Tour de Ski. But 850 points available in Canada, he knows that uh, on paper now, when you look at the World Cup uh, points table, he looks safe. But, you know, there's many a slip. You've got to get there in one piece. You've got to... Uh, get off the aircraft where you've got all that air conditioning where you might pick up a cold and that might just uh, take you down a bit so he's not taking any chances he today wants to win this and he also wants to get as many bonus points as he can some eager men out there good to see andrew musgrave they're uh, looking eager and uh, often you set your stall out early this is my intent today and great to see andrew looking so strong and up uh, in the front section of this race leg off david you mentioned him on the start line he's desperate for a win you can see his frustration in fact there he is he's desperate uh, and he's up with the front pack Keep and I and I think one uh, that you didn't mention is Marcus Hellner great to see him back in uh, and I think he's a threat today as well also worth keeping an eye out on uh, Maurice Magnificat uh, this sort of distance should be uh, well within his compass he's a recent winner having won that 10 kilometer classic race uh, in 
Where was it? Uh, just thinking now, Falun, of course, last weekend. Um, I said he took the weekend off, uh, but uh, remember, he, strangely enough, didn't do particularly well in the, uh, or as well, in the freestyle race when he was down in 13th place. So they're just sorting themselves out here on this first rotation. Taking on, as you can see, some drinks early on. It's the sort of journey where you need to regularly be taking in fluid. It's a day when you could easily dehydrate, but Jons Rutzenby already setting the pace there. Look at those Norwegian suits, four of them up there already, Mike. And the pace is not an easy pace. Jontrud Sumbi, with this uh, incredible form he's had since the end of November. He's uh, still, I think he's lost a little edge on that form, but certainly a fast pace in the early stages. So, Sandra Sumbi, then Krista Holland, then uh, Deerhaug, then it's Turnseth, then Magnificat, then uh, De Fabiani, the under-23 man, then 16 going for Jean-Marc Gaillard for uh, France, and Legkov just behind that little gaggle. I think Sumbi, Peter Nortuk, he's the, the wise old owl, isn't he now? He know, he's been the best at strategy throughout his career when he first came onto the World Cup at 19. But he, he knows today it's slightly slower up the front because of the snowfall, and he seemed to feel good about that. He knew that in the skating section, where the race really kicks off and the positions are fought for, that uh, it will be a, a pack will be held, I think, for nearly all of the race. And then, then it's down to the sprint, which absolutely suits Pedro Norto. So well. back into the stadium complex, and the crowd has strengthened. The reality, though, in terms of the host nation is that they're really hoping that someone like Matty Heikkonen could perhaps give them some finished cheer. The overall performance of the men's division of Finnish cross-country skiing has been uh, pretty poor, I have to say, over the whole campaign. So it would be timely with this being the dress rehearsal for next year's Nordic Worlds, for one of them to uh, come through and uh, give them some hope. And there, just going through, number 13, uh, you just saw there uh, is uh, Heikkonen in contention. So through the stadium for the first time, Sunbi leading. But uh, Matti Heikkonen, I was just mentioning before we deserted you, just 4.3 seconds away in 11th place, and Andrew Musgrave in 14th place, just under six seconds off the pace, needs to maintain that level of contact if he can. And then uh, Bulek Janin uh, in 12th place, also like Heikkonen, traveling uh, just under five seconds off the pace. And Bulek Janin, of course, just to remind you, the reigning world champion from Falun last year. He beat Dario Colonia and Alex Harvey of Canada into silver and bronze medal positions with Didrik Turnseth in fourth and Mag Maurice Magnificat in fifth place in a time of an hour and 16 seconds. But much more recently, Sunbi in the World Cup in December in Lillehammer, the only World Cup uh, full skiathlon we've had. Martin Jonsrud Sunbi this season beating Deerhaug, beating Holland, beating Shirota. A 1 2 3 4 for the Norwegian team ahead of Maurice Magnificat in fifth place, who you can now see is actually in third place here. Moving up there, that's uh, uh, wearing uh, 17. I uh, was just having a look at that, who that was. It was Vilegjanin or Bezmertnik, one of the two Russians. I uh, didn't quite catch that, but we'll check on that momentarily. And you can see Musgrave there, as I said, at 3.75 kilometers. He was six seconds down. He's lost eight, nine seconds since coming out of the stadium. Yes, that looked a little worrying when you're set your stall out, and that's where you are in the pack to lose to this point. I wonder if there's a... A slipping issue now that we're back into the hills. That was the flat section in the stadium area. But again, what you've got is Martin Jonsrud Sunbi up here, and he's using these hills, isn't he? And there uh, is uh, bid number 12, is it? 
just behind Sunbeam. Yeah, it's Sunbeam. It is Bersmietnik. Yeah, it's Bersmietnik. And Moniz, Magnificat. Nine is uh, Holland. Eight going through. That's uh, Krog. And just trying to look for number 10 here, which is Peter Nortuk. And there he is, just coming through, shoulder to shoulder, with Robin Dubiar of uh, France. Well, it's Martin Jondrud Sumbi. He's really picked the pace up, so he, he must have, uh, of course, there's bonus points on this lap, and he must be looking at hoovering up uh, those 15 bonus points. Yeah, it's not only that. I mean, like Teresa Johak, he really enjoys these sort of climbs. He does. And therefore, you know, he's very aggressive when he gets to these climbs, and he knows that he can really turn the screw on his opponents. Look, we're only through, what, barely 50, uh, you know, 5,000 meters, and he's got the field really stretched. <laughs> and he's had that ability all season to, when he wants to, press the button, turn the pace up. No one else dictates it like Sumbi, and they all respect it. They all have to follow what he does because nobody really wants to try and dictate it because Sumbi will pass them and get himself, place himself ahead. But Smietnik desperate for these 15 bonus seconds. Uh, points, I should say, not seconds. Well, Late. interesting to see whether Verlek Janin, who was first and sixth in Falun last weekend, the classic and then the freestyle which effectively makes up this sort of race it was a bit shorter in distance but uh Vilek Zanin finding his form as uh, a lot of the russians have and now you can see best mertnik uh, who's also uh, feeling the sort of leg cough frustrations because he's had quite a few opportunities to really you know get into contention but it was worth noting that in that race in Falun, the 10-kilometer classic race, he was the runner-up. And the Russians had a 1-2 there, Lekzhanin and then Besmertnik. So Besmertnik now deciding that he really wants to take over the lead. He does Peter Norto, big 10 there, just going round the bend. Almost running, a little bit like uh, Andy Musgrave there, uh, running. So an indication that there might be some issues with the grip wax. Or the grip part of their skis, be it uh, skins or zero skis. And there, just at the back there, was Heikkinen going through 20. That was Martin Yax of the Czech Republic. But that, that turn of pace, David, for those bonus points, they changed the shape of the race. And I think it's a good thing. Otherwise, you, you get a... It, we used to just get a massive group of uh, 25, 30 at the front, and slowly they would pick up the pace. But now things are uh, completely injected with pace. Well, some people would, uh, I guess, agree with you and others would disagree. You know, when you uh, look at the sort of Oslo race where, you know, Martin Jonsrud Sundby picked up 85 bonus points out of a possible 90 to add to the 100 he got for the race. Yes, I, I, but for the back down the track here, Village Janin, who is a very good pacer, he hasn't got involved with any of this crazy sprinting. Now, Sundby's dropped back here, and this might be an acceptance of... Uh, but he looks to me a little bit under pressure. For the first time, I think the whole season, he did second time. We saw him in the Tour de Ski, had one bad day, finishing 23rd. He looks a little unsettled at the moment. Bib number three, Maurice Magnificat. And look how quickly they're coming back into the stadium complex to complete the half classic distance. It's, uh, it's over in a flash, and that, that turn of pace has really, really split this field up completely. Well, it's interesting that Besmertnik couldn't uh, sustain that. And there you can see Legkov actually not too far off the lead. And the French skis running well. Legs chattering. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult marriage. You need good grip wax, uh, but you also need a good glide. Of course, the front and the back of the ski entirely glide wax instead of uh, the grip wax, which is in the center of the ski. Heikkinen's a little bit off the lead, but there seems to be really good determination today from him to try and get Finland into a prominent position. It's been a long time since there was a win. In fact, only ever two wins here in the, the heartbeat of Finnish cross-country skiing. And I think 89, Harry Kyrgyz and 89, and then 96, I think, for uh, Mika Mila, uh, for uh, Itumetsi. But well, he's only five seconds off the lead, but look at Best Mertnik there, down in 11th place, suddenly shot up and then fell back. 
Well, anyone that does distance racing then he will know that in big injections of pace can make you suffer later when you alter that steady pace setting. Well, there's no doubt that uh, Andrew Musgrave is a better freestyler than he is a classic racer, but he's now leaked 24 and a half seconds, and that's at the half distance, so he really needs to try and limit the damage here so that he gives himself a chance to... Uh, uh, you know, I want to see him in the top 30 at least, getting some World Cup points today, and that means he needs to stay close so he can really uh, use that freestyle accomplishment that he has to you know get him into a point scoring position and that will give him a, a, a confidence as you say mike you know these races over the weekend if you do well here it stays in your memory for next year's nordic world well that's right 22nd of february next year till the 5th of march and uh, and there will be the, the exact track they're using today will the be will be the ski athlon the Fabiani there with the bobble on his hat, the under-23 leader, much better at Classic. Well, it was interesting, wasn't it? You know, because we talked about the Fabiani and we thought that he was an out-and-out, -out, you know, classic he's racer. Well, he's, he's turned but, that around, hasn't he? What he did, because, you know, remember what he did uh, second. in Fallon, second in the 15-kilometre mass start with a fantastic final lunge. And that showed us that, you know, Again, this is very much his distance, but it really showed us that actually he can manage and he can be successful in both codes. And that was really the first time he showed us that. He showed himself that. He knew he had the ability for a, as a high standard freestyler, but to contend with the best on, on that one given day when they all started at the same time. I think he landed last weekend. So Finhog and Krog uh, pursuing Maurice Magnificat at the moment. And there's uh, Pedro Norto. Look at the running. way Pedro just run, it's running. That's not classic skiing in its true sense, where you slide the ski forward, like uh, at the front there, Magnificat. And Sumbi is a great image of how you slide through the hip, through the knee. And that's the efficient part. Pedro Norto so often runs. Yeah, and this is uh, him making his move. Uh, he's established himself. Now he knows where he is. He's had a time check when he went through the stadium the last time. He's got still the best half best part of half the race to go and now he's putting him or trying to bring himself into a position he's not in this lead group at the moment and but he's trying to bring himself into a position there you can see he's just chasing Heikkinen wearing bib number 13 and he's now closing up because what he's got in his mind is it's not so much the bonus points it's actually being there for the pit stop change on the freestyle leg I think so, and uh, of course there's bonus points to Hoover up this time, and I think that's why the pace has remained strong. I think it will taper off once they cross the, the bonus sprint line, uh, rebuild a little again before the final classic lap. You might have seen Shirota there, uh, wearing four just at the back of that little uh, gaggle of uh, skiers. Shirota, he was fourth in Lillehammer at the beginning of the season. And Magnificat it is. Eight out to the right there. That's Finn Hogan Crow. I haven't really given him a mention. And they're chasing uh, the leader, Jean-Marc Gaillard of France. So two Frenchmen up there. There's Hakenen. There's uh, Peder Nortuk. De Fabiani. And 12, Best Mertnik trying to regain his place. 22, Nget from uh, Norway. And then uh, that's probably... Oh, uh, well, it's actually Jonas Bauman of Switzerland. I was thinking it might have been somebody else, but uh, it's actually Jonas Bauman. Um, oh, look, look at Helner slipping madly there at bit 21 in the middle. A couple of times he put all, he's having to really transfer all his weight above and onto the, each ski to compress it down. And as Gloerson for Norway in that pack there. And uh, have a look at this. The Frenchmen are really storming this classic leg and I, they're working together. I think they've got fantastic, they've got the waxmen have got the balance of a good grip and a good glide because Magnificat and, uh, and we don't often put the Frenchmen as, uh, as being the best in terms of classic, certainly the freestyle. Well, bonus sprint coming up here and Sunbi improving on the far side, you can see. So he didn't panic, he just uh, settled. And then look at this, it's like a parade of Norway here. Two, Dierhau, five, turn Seth. And then uh, after that, uh, 
you can see there, eight. That's uh, Krog. And behind him, I can tell you, is uh, Peter Nortuk. And Gaillard and Magnificat. Who would have predicted that? Uh, I think we could safely say over the years, their strength, as I mentioned earlier, is freestyle. But to be breaking the field, it's, it's a great moment for the French team because they are slightly stronger in the freestyle. Yeah, they slightly, apart from Maurice Magnificat, who has been a winner this season, they've slightly flattered to deceive. Mm. You know, they have, you know, like in Oslo, uh, in the 50-kilometer race, they were there or thereabouts, but they didn't have the kill when it mattered most. No, you need to keep a bit of sting to Fabiani. You can see the base of his skis. There's a, the yellow, that's the mohair-type skin that's giving him the grip, but he, he's flat today. He's struggling with this blistering pace at the front. But you can see the Norwegians, they've, you know, decided to attach a piece of string to the Frenchman, and little by little, they're reeling him in, and there's Peter Norton. Look at Norton. He was detached, David, by 22 seconds, and he's so clever at strategy. He realized that this lead group are, are not slowing down, so he had to bridge that gap, and not an easy thing to do when you're 24, 25 seconds behind to then make contact again. It's a lot of effort. Yeah, well, he, it's absolutely crucial that he stays in touch because uh, any more distance would make the freestyle legs just that much harder. But I'm really impressed the way the two Frenchmen are out there. Magnificat, though, doing the donkey work. Now, I thought that the pace might slow down. I think it has a little, eh, allowing it to gather again in one big pack at the front. Well, this is where Nortuk needs to take advantage because he needs to really just come up and get on the ski tails. There, but Legkov, we haven't talked about Legkov that much, but look at this, a bull of a man, and he's really <laughs> in there, and uh, there's a great deal of determination in the skiing there, you know, he looks uh, as if he really means business today, he's gone third. He's so strong, I've seen some clips of his gym sessions, how he creates that strength in the summer, and he is, he is so strong, and I'd love to also know the capacity of his lungs, normal human being, about four litres, he's probably on seven and a half litres. Well, there was always the thing, isn't it, if you're a great Olympic champion like he was in Sochi. You remember Giorgio Di Cento when he won in 2006. And then, you know, we didn't see Giorgio Di Cento. So it, it was all like, well, you know, that was a, was that a one-day wonder? And Lenkov is very conscious of the fact that he wants to prove, you know, season in, season out, that he's a master of his craft. Well, uh, he's not just the Olympic yeah, champion. And he's been frustrated, uh, you know, the season after the Olympics, as expected with all his commitments that summer, he wasn't that good, but he's come back into this season with real desire and, and frustration that he hasn't been at the top. He's well, you don't he's see the, today. I'll tell you what, Mike, you don't see this very often. Two Frenchmen and a Russian giving some <laughs> Norwegians a skiing lesson. And you know, as soon as <laughs> Sumbi, Sumbi has dictated everything. He's wearing yellow because he's had the strength to do that. But isn't it interesting, the psychology, as soon as he looks a little flat, others then begin to feel a little more, little more confident that they can win and break him. And there's Nortug. He's almost uh, at the back there on the tails of Dirhau. Heikinen needs to try and make contact with that lead group, and I think they might slow down slightly. Best Mertnik there, just behind uh, Fabiani, behind him. So under 3.75 kilometers to go for the leaders before they come into the pits to change their skis and. This is uh, a pretty crucial time. The 11.25-kilometer uh, point, and De Fabiani and Besmertnik, they all look rather labored. I can tell you that Sharota of uh, Norway, who was at the back of the leading pack, he's called it a day. Uh, very uncharacteristic for sure to do that, so there must have been something well, seriously that's gone wrong. Well, he wasn't at the races last weekend, he's been a little unwell and this is his first outing back. Also already, a DN didn't, didn't uh, someone else pulled out, Nico Koskela, bib 76, uh, who's a club racer brought in by the Finnish team with the advantage of you can race more athletes when you're staging the World Cup yourself. Pace has definitely slowed down. Yes, it's after that bonus sprint, and now they're just sort of really gathering themselves, the leaders. Two Frenchmen, a Russian, and then uh, five Norwegians there, led by Sunby, with uh, Peter Nortug just at the back of that little fivesome. 
That's got to be intimidating, hasn't it? Two Frenchmen, the Russian, being breathed on by five outstanding Norwegians, just hunting six uh, with Nortug in there as well at the back. So there you can see the uh, differentials. And uh, just having a little look at Nordzug there was Finn Krog, who's uh, <laughs> maybe in trouble. That's a lot of energy when you're stamping your way up, as Peter Nordzug is, and it's clear that, uh, that even when the wax isn't working well, you have to, as an athlete, find a way to try and get some purchase. But that was always one of his trademarks. You remember that he'd sit at the back of a group of athletes and then he'd put in one of those little bursts, just like you saw there, and cruise up just to announce himself to everybody. Uh, that would cycle psychologically uh, what are you doing there uh, and and that would put them off and then he dropped back a little bit and then sometime later he just I'm still here I, he, and you know over the last 10 years it's been amazing and a joy to watch him do, doing all the giving all those psycho psychological tactics but to be fair Mike uh, they've sussed him and uh, it's been well, quite a few years since he's been able to do that and that's why we don't have a pack of 40 at the front because if you have a pack of 40 as we've seen many many times over the last 10 years it only plays or it has has always played into the hands of Peter Norton. Now they have to go strong from the gun to break him early, and in doing that, breaking most of the rest of the field. So Heikkinen doesn't look as if he's got much more to do. He's ahead of uh, Best Metnik, and at the moment it's just not happening for him. Now he's getting a lot of support uh, next year. On the 25th of February, the skiathlon, we'd expect, what, some 25, 30,000 people in the stadium and around the track, but uh, he's getting so much of the support that is here today, hiking in. NordicSkiTV at gmail.com if you've got any uh, questions or thoughts that you'd like to uh, pass across to us. Set. Magnificat at the front, he's, uh, he's on his limits, he's wanting to get into the ski change, get his skating skis on and uh, really I think he, he'll be thinking, well that is my strength and if I'm leading my weaker aspect of this ski athlon, it's a good day for me. Very good afternoon to uh, Kim uh, over in Calgary. Uh, thanks very much. I gather you're going to be in Calgary when the uh, Tour of Canada comes through. And, uh, yeah, we'll certainly uh, try to connect with you to uh, add some local knowledge when the tour gets over to your part of the world. I guess it's uh, uh, pretty early morning at the moment for you. And uh, good to hear from you, and thanks for getting in uh, contact with us. And, and, and David, on that vein, uh, worth mentioning today, of course, the Canadians not here in preparation for the, the final stages over there. Here's a question, and I think it's from June in Santorini in Greece, Mike. And this relates to uh, the yesterday's Nordic combined. And uh, she's saying, is it possible to dislocate your shoulder while you're skiing? Um, surely there has to be an accident for this to happen. It, it, it is... <laughs> It doesn't have to be an accident. If a shoulder has come out before, it is a weakened shoulder, and I believe he's had issues there in the past, and he's only 18-year-old, Reba. Um, I do know of an athlete, uh, Mark Crosdale, British Marine, actually racing at the 1992 Olympics. His shoulder came out. It had done often before in the 15-kilometer classic. He stopped, he found a tree, and, 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 and managed, with the tree's help, to get the shoulder back in, and he finished his race. He was in a world of pain, but it is possible. So NordicSkiTV at gmail.com is our email address and Maurice Magnificat now being uh, shadowed by Martin Jonsrudsenby. Duvia back in third place. But this has been a, a real piece of determined skiing by Maurice Magnificat. And of course he's pushing on, Sunby's closing on him, Duvia's there, six is leg cough. And uh, right behind this group of uh, Norwegians, led by Didrik Turnseth, wearing bib number five. And there's a little gap opening up there to Petter Nortug, but it's not at the moment that worrisome. I think he'll be okay when they switch over, which will be the next time they come back into the stadium now. Pit stop time, very uh, close now, Mike. So, uh, once again, take us through the routine. So, the, depending on your height, your skis are longer, some 10 centimetres, 15 centimetres longer than these, your freestyle, your skating skis. 
This ski is more rigid. It's shorter, much more rigid, and it's a glide waxed from tip to tail. Your ski poles in the Classic are slightly shorter, so now they'll be picking up longer ski poles, allowing you more purchase in the freestyle technique. No wax, it's an entirely slippy glide factor wax from tip to tail. So now they're just uh, coming into the stadium, but they'll also be conscious of just calming themselves a little bit so that they can do the pit stop change of skis and poles efficiently. And then, of course, they'll be out on another 15,000 meters in freestyle uh, skate. Odd and even numbers. That's right. Odd to our right, their left, and uh, evens to our left, their right. And, and as you say, look at the little bit of calm down. You need to compose yourself so you're not too flustered. So nine out of 76 almost in together. Incredible, incredible. And you lift the bindings up, and, well, that was fast. And they, you have to place the metal clip into the teeth of the jaws of the binding, close the, the lever. Then uh, the Velcro gloves uh, straps back on. It always takes a little bit of time. That's why they don't use these in biathlon, because look at the amount of time to get your ski straps on. In biathlon, it's a different hold because of that. Well, they did that uh, all pretty well, but there you can see the next group coming in. Heikinen leading the group ahead of Best Mertnik to Fabiani Nguyen. Jonas Bauman, Musgrave in there with a minute and 11 inside the top 20, Mike. Uh, so now Andrew well. Musgrave has a real chance of getting inside the world's top 30 and getting some World Cup points. So he's, he's given himself a chance Please God, he's going to capitalise on I it. I hope so, and, and that, you know, when you look at this, the world of uh, cross-country racing, Andrew Musgrave, 15th at the moment. Yes, it's a minute 11 down, but uh, I hope and believe he can get further up the field. Well, as the pace clear, uh, steadied after that bonus sprint, it really helped the likes of Musgrave to maintain the contact, to not lose too many seconds. A minute and 11, it's, he's not going to get up to the front there, but he's got a real chance of... Uh, you know, finishing in the top 30, I'd like to think. I mean, if he could finish in the top 20, that would be great. If he could actually improve on 15th place, that would be uh, even, even better. So as you see the uh, standings here, Michael bring you up to date momentarily about the 15,000 meters in skate and the track profile. But uh, just waiting for these standings to be completed and a brightening afternoon in Lati so Mike uh, how much difference is this in terms of the freestyle skate? It's a strange feeling, eh? especially in the, the freestyle. It's as, if, it's as if you've been out running and then you're jumping onto... My only feeling that's similar is uh, then jumping onto a bike with a, a real hard gearing. Your legs don't react well, and it certainly takes a, a kilometre, a couple of kilometres, to get into your stride with these new muscle groups now coming into use. And look how much happier Finn Hogan Kroll is in the freestyle skate. He's moved up from virtually the back of that little pack of Norwegians into third place. Very much. We started, David, at the low point in the stadium. We're now at the base of the ski jump, and it's been 3 minutes 20 already of a continual climb to this point. It's a brutal introduction to the skating section. He's very keen to get on to the front two because he is a decent sprinter as well. Legkov uh, just dropping back positionally, but he's not out of this. Eight going through there, that's... Uh, Finn Krog. Well, he looked, he looked spent, but he knows the importance of getting into the slipstream of his teammate Sumbi. And what about Gaia? This, this, this transition, oh, this it, it, some people uh, struggle more than others, and Gaia struggling, quite honestly, in this first part. What about Pedro Norto? Likewise, he came in with the pack. Not looking comfortable. No, that's uh, very strange. I mean, he's lost an eternity of ground. Uh, leaving the stadium. I don't quite understand but that at Ma all. Magnificat has set a brutal pace and it really has uh, shocked, I think, Nortug and his teammate Gaia. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it... No, there's something wrong here, Mike. There's got to be something wrong. You know, Nortug's a better athlete than this. He's plodding. His desire was to win today, David, and he... Uh, he's looking... He needs help. He's looking behind. Where's the rest of the pack? Well, they're 45 seconds off. 
but he's. I mean, uh, no, 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 I agree with you. He's uh, sorry, the pack of uh, close well, the, pack, right, the pack's there, led by De Fabiani of uh, Italy, but I mean, he looks as if he's hit some sort of wall. He has, he without a doubt has. That 15 kilometers classic, he remember we saw him bridging the gap, altering his pace. He's not at the moment quite with it. So De Fabiani coming through, there's Hakenham wearing bib number 13 and 22 that's marcus helner in there as well and, and i think we can't discount when you go no, through sorry it's not it's nunge i beg your nunge. pardon when you go through yesterday the four times around that 1.5 kilometer it's a brutal hit on the body and uh, quite possibly that's uh, what's caught up with nortug today i'd like to go back a little further and see one or two of the other groups uh, it would be nice if our uh, director would give us that possibility but of course he's uh, fascinated as we are uh, with the duel between Magnificat and also Sunbi but you can see there were nine at transition and basically there are five away there's a Frenchman there's a Norwegian oh another Norwegian and oh. another one and another one they're looking more <laughs> comfortable and Sunbi uh, in second place with those 700 points that he has leading the World Cup looking much more comfortable now I think and Legkov detached there not out of it but uh, they're really turning the screw well Morris Magnificat is turning the screw because he knows he has to make this relentless and remorseless but what's it doing to him we saw uh, Magnificat uh, not quite on form in one of the two races last weekend I thought he'd gone and in the one he was expected to win the freestyle well, Legkov's got to get back into this, and basically, I think Legkov's chance is he's got to, on these rotations, he's got to work his way to the front, and he's got to try to make a break. He's not a renowned sprinter, you're right, for those final uh, important 200 metres, Legkov will need to be at the front with a gap. So this is rotation number one in freestyle. I would think by rotation number three, at the very latest, he's got to be up the front and making a break. He has, but this pace is brutal. You can see the expression on Magnificat's face. This is hurting him as well as the rest of the world, but more so the rest. This bridge is the very high point of the course, so they will think, blimey, we need a break now. And the terrain is a little more gentle after this on the journey back to the stadium. So, uh, Maurice Magnificat, the world silver medalist, worth remembering this, over 15 kilometers freestyle, and that's what he's uh, skiing basically now. That was in Falun last year, and he was fifth in the World Championship Skiathlon behind Vilek Janin, who has never really showed at the races today. Uh, so, uh, that's uh, a little surprising for me, I have to say. Uh, Maurice Magnificat, 29 years of age, strong, mature, and now one of those athletes who you have to really respect in this sort of race. The terrain now is still recovery time here, so they're getting a good 25 seconds uh, gulping as much air as they can possible. Now they turn to the right, and this is a quite brutal climb coming up now. It's interesting, uh, you know, that silver medal in Falun was his first major senior individual championship, but you know, go back now, what would it be, uh, seven years, and he was under the under-23 world champion at 15 kilometers in freestyle. So that's, you know, when he was 22, he was winning that. He's 29 now. He's won a silver medal last year, and he's right up to the front, and that's Morris Magnificat. Uh, he's, uh, he really has matured this season, I think. He's... he's He's been there and thereabouts, as you say, for a very long time, but he's got, he has more status, more confidence. What about Nicholas Dirhag? We haven't really talked about him, but he's wearing bib number two in third place there. The Trondheimer, again, uh, 28, mature, strong, and the runner-up at the beginning of the season in the Lillehammer pursuit. He's such a fighter. Remember that great day in Oslo, what, three weekends ago, when he glued himself to Jondrud Sundby for the 50-kilometer? A chase and uh, what, only finished 18 seconds behind Sumbi over the 50 kilometers. Yeah, and you know, he was uh, also runner-up in the Tour de Ski in the 15 kilometer classic mass start. So here they come. They've got three more rotations to go as they come into the Lati Stadium. This is one of the world's most famous ski stadiums. Uh, I can remember races, well, uh, giving everything away at the end of the uh, 
the 80s, uh, 89, the World Championships here. That was the year of, you know, Marta Matikainen when she sort of burst through as one of the superstars of the sport. Yeah, I actually raced it. I just came off the back of a World Championships biathlon and uh, came up to race here. It was a, a wonderful feeling and the, and the city was buzzing, absolutely buzzing. And the, the fans, the spectators were brilliant. And we'll see that again next year. Uh, a real good feel in the stadium and round the tracks. This is tough, isn't it? You know, for Gaillard, you get detached and then you're sort of in no man's land. And, it, you know, it's tough to be out there on their own. Up the hill they go, out the stadium. But it's France versus Norway. With a sprinkling and, uh, of Russia. Russia in there as well. So, not really much change here. Uh, computers are playing up there. Sorry about that. Uh, a bit of uh, a difficult excuse on our side, so we can't actually, at this moment in time, uh, keep you in touch with Andrew Musgrave's progress. It's only pictorially that we can do it. As soon as they uh, come back to us, we'll, of course, look further down the field than we have at present. There's Legkov there. Well, he's taken himself off the back, and uh, it's Finn Horgan Kroh who's now demoted. It's quite a lot of work coming out of the stadium after they started the freestyle leg and maybe paying for that now. I really like the rhythm of Deerhard there in third place. I do. He's not the best finisher. Uh, we've seen that a couple of times, so he, he would have to be ahead um, coming into that last 100, uh, and he'll know that. Turnseth is, is impressing me as always. Bib number five there. He's, he, we never really see him taking on too much, but he's always there or thereabouts. Yeah, like uh, Deerhard, another Trondheimer. Uh, five, four or five years younger, but of course he was uh, third in the 30-kilometer Mass Start Classic race in Lenzerheide, fourth in Oslo, so he's got plenty of pedigree. Uh, he's never won a World Cup race. He was runner-up in Davos over 15 kilometers Classic last year. Go back the year before, he was third here in the 15 kilometer Classic, not here, but in Lillehammer in 2014. Those are probably... Uh, with this year's third in Lenzerheide, those are his three top finishing positions. Things are picking up at the front again, David, because of these bonus second, bonus points, I should say, sprints coming up fairly soon. And Gaia, the pace he set in the classic, has, is beginning to, well, have some payback in his body. Well, this is one of the, uh, well, I don't know whether it's a problem, but it's a, a resulting fact of these bonus sprints, isn't it? Because it with, is. with the amount of points that you can actually gain, it means that if you can't keep contact, uh, then, you know, that pace, as you say, is, oh, it, did. Uh, it, it's, it sort of becomes artificially strong. It knocks you out. And, and, if, and that's where I thought Villigianen was sensible. He didn't go with any of these uh, alterations of pace. I thought he was being masterful, but he, he's obviously not at the races. And, and uh, we saw a guy out there looking back. He's just needing help. He, he wants to get involved with a pack. He won't be involved with this pack of eight at the front. Well, this is far from over, Mike. I think it's fascinating. There's, you know, this, there's, there's, there are men in there in that top group of, you know, five or six who are just at the moment, you know, they've all got something going through their head, haven't they, about tactics. The, and, and those, those are, those are uh, behind are looking at the body language of those in front of them. And often in, in a race, you know, in any endurance race, two-thirds distance is payback time. You know if you've gone too hard too soon, you know how you're going to cope with the final most important third, and so much will be going through the minds of each of these athletes. Can I win it? What do and, I need to do to break the rest? And the other thing is, how comfortable is Maurice Magnificat at the front there? Because essentially, he is dictating the pace. So if he's actually feeling comfortable in the way that he's skiing here, and, you know, he's stretching these Norwegians, then uh, yeah. it, it's, quite, it's, it's quite fascinating, really. Well, here's the bonus sprint coming up. I think Magnificat at the front is just trying to relentlessly break them down and try and get rid of them, but it's, it's not working. So 15 points coming his way, he's done enough there. And what is it, 12 and then 10 picked up there by Turnseth in third place. Well, but my calculation there, Sunbi has picked up, what, 30, 35, 30, 34 points. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 all, it's all good stuff, really, in terms for him. 
because, you know, very soon he'll just be focusing on trying to win the race. Yeah. yeah. Guy Albert somehow looks like he's got it, he's getting his rhythm, there's some feeling back. He was, he was an uncomfortable last time we saw him, but now there's flow and rhythm. And 22, that's uh, Nuenget of uh, Norway, who's broken away from the group with De Fabiani. And uh, his target is actually Gaia. And uh, gaia has got a target on his back, and Nunez is <laughs> actually looking at it at the moment. And that helps you when you're racing. You need something. All right, there's someone uh, 12 seconds up the track, and that helps. Hopefully, will help Nunez uh, push on. Speedy corner. It's a very fast corner, and all this is a lovely section uh, of recovery under the tunnels, and then you've got the brutal right-hander, but it's not a big one, and then you get the recovery into the stadium. But then those men who were going up and round the turn there, how depressed are they when they see the leaders just going away and uh, heading towards the stadium? And there, Maurice on the upgrade there, on the upslope, uh, increasing the pressure, using that incline. Legkopf right at the back and Dierhout just in front of him. Unfortunately, computers are still not working to see the gaps uh, back to the chasing pack. De Fabiani, uh, I think they're holding level. Haven't talked about uh, Hans Christer Holland in there wearing bib number nine. He's the 26 year old Norwegian who uh, has yet to achieve anything at senior championships. He was the bronze medalist again, uh, what would it be, some seven years ago in the junior world 20 kilometer pursuit race. The juniors race a distance 10 kilometers less than the seniors. But, you know, that was a great medal. And uh, the year before, he won the 10 kilometer uh, classic junior world medal. So this is this uh, fantastic reservoir of talent as they come to uh, the wicked right-hander. <laughs> Mike, uh, you don't think it's quite as wicked as it used to be? Honestly, it used to be more wicked. <laughs> it was a lot tighter than this, and it had to be banged up on the left side. So definitely they've opened up this uh, area quite in there with the bridges, uh, opened it up to what it used to be. With rifle on your back, uh, that was always quite a tricky bend. So Morris Magnificat coming in, and of course there's still 7,500 metres to go, and Sunby in second place. And there you can see, seven of them together. Now, this is, this is hard work for Magnificat up the front. If he was making an impression and getting rid of more, then yes, keep the strategy. But you would think he might uh, accept someone else taking the lead here, because I don't think long-term is playing into his hands, his favour. Well, you can't tell. It's really difficult to tell, because mm. if he is comfortable within himself, and you can see here, again, the just uh, accelerates, trying. uses the incline. So he's, he must be brutally confident of his ability today to win this one. Sunbi moving up shoulder to shoulder with Magnificat. Well, still the computers, I'm sorry to say, frustrating us. So, seven and a half thousand meters to uh, go. So, you're seeing what we're seeing in terms of uh, time differentials. Uh, hopefully, uh, the pack. Uh, well, I was hoping that we were going to get the next yeah, page of that. Yeah, 102, the big chasing pack is 102 behind. Just ahead of them is uh, Jean Marc Gaillard. And uh, Muzzy's in that big group and 18th place, 132 behind. So this is uh, quite hopeful with 7,500 metres to go. If he's managed his energy well, if he didn't use too much on the classic leg, then uh, he's in with a, a real shaft. And, you know, if you're saying that he's right there, Mike, I mean, you know, is it too much to think that he uh, could squeeze to 11th, 12th? I would love that to happen. It's not impossible. He's only got, a, what, 20 seconds up to that ninth place in Ninget at the moment. So a top 10 is not impossible. Look what's happened here. As soon as Sumbi's hit the front, he's hurt Magnificat. He's absolutely hurt Legkov and Deerhide. Yeah, so that's excellent pacing. That is the racing brain, isn't it, in Sunbi? And, and, you know, and, 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 and like, to, sorry, Therese Johaug, Johaug as well, as soon as it comes to steep hills, he can hurt the rest of the field more than it hurts himself. You, you, you can't do what Sunbi does if you're not, you know, bright, smart, knowledgeable. Oh, so much so. And look at the, the incredible Finn Hogg and Croker. Uh, he is such a fighter. He said he was tired, uh, 
before Oslo three weeks ago. Well, he's really yo-yoed, hasn't he? And uh, you can see that injection of pace has caught out Nicholas Durhal. So he's having uh, just a poor patch at the moment. <laughs> he is. And Legkov ahead of him. Just seems that Legkov can't get in amongst them. He really just can't get in amongst those Norwegians. And now you can see here, there they are, four of them away ahead of Magnificat. The man at the back there hangs Christa Holland and you know of those what? four. For Magnificat to have led David for those, what, a six, seven kilometers, I don't think it played into his, to his hand and now he's struggling with that injection of pace with Sumbi resting in behind him for so long. Not over that because this is the penultimate rotation. So if Magnificat can, you know, recover, I mean, I'm t I am worried about the distance that he's dropped off the front four here, but you can see what it's doing. I mean, you know, it's Sunby who's now uh, punishing Hans Christian Holland at the back of that quartet. He is, but uh, what he's done there with that injection of pace, it's separated anyone else except now four Norwegians at the front. Lekov uh, hurting, uh, Magnificat hurting. They can come back with the recovery section coming up after the bonus sprint soon. But once you're detached, it's, it's a hard way, it's a hard journey to make your way back. And there, the camera angle you could see is, uh, rather than being head-on, side-on, and it really shows you the difference. Now, you look to your left there for Magnificat, and that is a big gap to close. And I saw Sumbi had a look over, and he thought, OK, I've got to hurt him more when he's hurting, uh, so he's now going to put another, he is, he's putting another injection of pace in. Wants uh, Magnificat out of it. And Sunby, you know, when you look at the four Norwegians up there, who's the most comfortable, Mike? The man in the front. He's so balanced. Um, he's worked so much in the gym to get the taut, to build the strength, to hold the balance on these skis. Thank you very much. Another 15 points. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, Sunby pressing on. Look at Legkov. He, he has, he's been desperate to win. He's tried today, but uh, all but spent at the moment. Need to go back to this second chasing group. I know uh, the obvious thing is to stick with the leaders, but I'd like to see, obviously, I'd like to see how Muzzy is skiing. I'd like to see how Heikkinen is skiing, the Fabiani. These are the people I'd really like to see at the moment. And uh, at the moment, unfortunately, uh, our director seems obsessed with just staying with the front here. But, you know, there are valuable World Cup points at stake uh, just behind as well. And that chasing pack, well, it was 102 behind at the stadium uh, and uh, Nortug uh, dropping back as well. But um, 102 it was. I think he's extended it more with this turn of pace from Sumbi. You're always doing something on this track, aren't you? <sighs> it's difficult. And even the rest sections, this is the only real rest. We've been descending, but you're working left and right. This is the only straight glide where you can fill the lungs get some recovery and there's the gradient of the hill to the left which they're going to head up now before the little bit little bit back into the woods before uh, that gentle drop down and the sharp right hander into the stadium but when you uh, come to the last rotation the last 3.75 kilometers you need to bring that speed down on the glide to bring it into the incline very much and these four are so aware Holland at the back they are there turn Seth uh, and Krog they're so aware they have to glue themselves no matter what the pain with Sumbi to have a chance for the podium well, I don't know what the Finns are going to make of this. They, earlier in the day, watched Teresa Johaug lead Heidi Veng, Ingvild uh, Erzberg and Micah Kaspersvall into a 1-2-3-4 for Norway. And this is looking uh, pretty well the same. Finland's Rita Lisa Ropponen was the best of the rest in fifth place. And uh, Magnificat could still be best of the best, but, you know, now he's got detached. Now he's uh, really suffering. Uh, that energy loss, as you see the bonus point sprints uh, being confirmed there yet again as they come to this uh, right-hander. Staying in the aerodynamic tuck uh, as late as possible to then just stand tall, wait on the outside ski, bring yourself round the corner and then straight away take advantage of the speed running down into the stadium. You need, you always need to try and carry pace, don't you? And that left-hander, it kills your pace off, so yeah, important to get a couple of strides, a couple of skates, carry more momentum down here. Finn Hagen at the front now. Yeah, he's yo-yoed a bit, but uh, he's obviously 
Still got uh, enough in the tank. He's the sprinter amongst these uh, four. I wonder if he just wanted to feel that for next time round, which is to the finish line. A Magnificat, you can see more than 100 metres behind. That's got to hurt the pace well. You feel it slowed down ever so slightly with Finn Hagen Croft at the front. Now, I hope we uh, can see the chasing pack come in here as well. We know that the uh, front boys are away and we know that, that uh, they're now going up the hill out of the stadium, but I'd really like to see this pack coming into the stadium. As you say, they were just over a minute or so behind. Last time we had a reliable time check. Unfortunately, I would say they're going to be more than a minute 15, minute 20 possibly behind next time round. So Finn Hagen Crow ahead of Martin Jons Rutsundi. Didrik Tuanseth uh, in there in third place at the moment. And this is uh, Nunget coming back into the stadium complex. It is indeed. Now I wonder what's happening with Ed Norto. Well, this is, well... Nien gets done well. Sorry, David, he was a minute two behind, but he had a huge pack with him. He's left the pack behind, and he hasn't lost too many seconds over this last three point. Yeah, it's actually five. sometimes as he made the break. What, what he has done, though, is to... Uh, he's overtaken Jean-Marc Gaillard, who was his target, and uh, that's the main move for uh, him. And you can get he's only 23 year old, so another star in the making in right. this Norwegian factory. Now, of here we go, in here. So, skipping round there, that looks as... Oh, that was 51, that was uh, Larry Lehtonen. Yeah, so uh, Jean-Marc Gaillard, we're going to hopefully get this uh, check now as they come through. 11 is uh, Vilek Jean in, in that group, trying to spot... Uh, there's Muzzy. There's Muzzy in there. So Muzzy 14th. in 14th place, Good 158. Man. Now, how much has he got left? I'm starting to think, hope, uh, yeah, 10. You just pulled out Peter Nortug there, and that would be a great scalp. It wouldn't be the first time that Muzzy's had the better of Peter Nortug, because he's done that in Norwegian races. But in a World Cup race, that's a good scalp to take as we go back to the leaders. I'm just wondering, you know, is that... Uh, is, is that, you know, 11th place possibility for Muzzy? I think it is. I think it and is. Wh and where would that rank in his, in his performances? Well, he's had that first, remember, in Toblach over the 25 kilometres last year, the pursuit competition. Yeah, but, but this but year up in Ruka... Ruka 12th, wasn't it? His yeah. position. And remember, he had that stumble going up the hill. Yeah. And he would have been 11th for sure. He would certainly have put anything uh, in that top bracket, top 20 uh, for Muzzy. I know he wants more and he always wants more and, uh, and I believe he can achieve more, but it, it takes a long building process. But he's got all the motivation in the world, you know, to uh, keep going there. Actually, he was 13th in the 10 kilometer freestyle in uh, Ruka, 11th in the 15th uh, yeah. classic pursuit. So, uh, uh, some people dispute that, don't they? The, 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 the winning the Toblak race last year because it was within the Tour de Ski. But a win's a win in my book. Well, he was the fastest man in the world that day, track time over 25 kilometres. Yes, it was a pursuit, a chase, but it, it was still, they all covered the same distance. Yeah, well, it, 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 it's all about whether you cross the line in first place, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, and. Sunbi now pressing on again. He's thinking, well, I've still got four. I'm going to make it three and then two and he's then uh, one and then just himself. Uh, that will be going through his mind right now. One man at the front. But uh, Turnseth is, is uh, gripping on well today in third place. And uh, Finn Hagen, as always, a fighter in second. Hulland uh, beginning to suffer, I think, at the, at the back there. Remember the women's race was uh, a quick time by uh, Teresa Juhalg and the snow was much heavier in her race than it is here. I mean, a minute 05 to this point, 65 minutes, and uh, Lillehammer was one in, uh, what was it, 79 minutes, and the World Championships in 76 minutes. So uh, this looks as if it's going to be uh, pretty quick as well. 
So this is the final stage now and uh, now each of these men up front, the foursome, now have got to make up their minds, you know, what their tactics are going to be. I mean, are they going to wait? Well, I, we saw Finn Hagen Crow trying, experimenting with leading into the stadium, and he saw that as the absolute advantage. So he had a feel for that last time around. Sumbi knows that he wants that lead into the right hander prior to the final 250 meters. Uh, so I think that I think it's going to turn completely uh, sprint very very soon to to separate this to make some gap at the front. So nine at the back there, Hans Christo Holland. There they go. In front of him, Didrik Turnset. Eight there, that's uh, Finn Horgan Cross, Sunby at the front. And now the pressure's really on. And you can see Finn Horgan Crow uh, trying to stay with Sunby. And there you go. Once again, Sunby. And look at the way that he accelerates away. Again, he. You know, it doesn't give them a chance to even catch half a breath. He didn't take them by surprise. They were expecting it, but they still can't stay with it. He knew the... F and it's still climb, climb, climb up to the bridge. He's still got more hard to throw at them. Yeah, but look at this. You know, when he, he just moved away and again moving away. And suddenly they were, you know, they were a gaggle within four meters. And now, what is that? What would you say that is? Uh, 10, 15 meters? 10 back to Finn Hagen. Yeah. Another 12, 15 back to Tunseth. Uh, but they can maybe make this back up. Pull some of it back on this descent. But soon be the wisdom of him. He wanted air gap. So there was no drafting back to Finn Hagen. You can hear him breathing, he's gasping. Well, they, Mike, they must be, when they get to, you know, uh, these, the top of these climbs there, they, they must be really at max. Oh, your heartbeat, uh, you, you know, you've got your comfortable working pace and then you've got your absolute max and he'd be willing to take it to max because of this recovery section. So now, coming back through this tunnel and this is where you need to carry the speed into the incline. He's, he's done it, he's done it, he's going to hurt again here, he's going to break uh, Finn Hagen even more. Finn Hagen knows that the, the fight is all but done. Yeah, five there's turn set, then uh, Hans Christer Holland, but still four Norwegians in charge of this race, and yeah, you know, Magnificat, I'm afraid he's out of this. Uh, as you said, uh, you questioned the amount of work he was doing, you were absolutely right to do so, and uh, now here, you know, leading what is now looking to be a procession of Norwegian athletes, Yet again, Martin Jonsrud Sundby, the leader of the World Cup and uh, looking uh, really solid now, isn't it? He just looks so strong. Composed and he, he managed, he's so strong, he managed to skate to so far up the steepest part of the track, getting rid of his teammates and then he danced into skate one and uh, again just opened up the gap. Now he's got a safety margin, first man round this corner wins. And if he crosses the line in first place, which he's probably about to do very shortly, it will be only his second Skiathlon World Cup success. So... And Peter Nortuk's got four, remember? I thought Peter was going to try and create a fifth, which hasn't been done before. But he didn't have it today. No, and Sunbi uh, coming round here. And... Uh, the two stars of Norwegian cross-country sport, Teresa Johau and Martin Jonsrudsen, be not for the first time this season, are going to uh, do the double here. And it's going to be a Norwegian 1, 2, 3, 4, Finn Hogan Crow in uh, second place. And there's a right battle between Holland and Turnseth going on. And Holland with a little bit more speed there coming in to grab the podium. And that's that's real determination. He had that in his mind. And he's out sprinted Finn Hogan Crow to get that podium. Hey, Turnseth, Krug, Krug was uh, took the second there. Uh, Krug, yeah, Krug was uh, second. I mean, uh, sorry, I was talking about Turnseth being beaten by Holland. I do beg your pardon. You're absolutely right. And poor old uh, Turnseth, he, he did so much that was perfect in that race, and he just got everything a little wrong at the end. And here comes Dins, uh, uh, Deerhawk to turn the screw. He's got past Magnificat, and that's one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> 
Uh, Manificat, the first of the non-Norwegians, he just slaps his thighs as if to say, what, what, I, what, you know, what could I do? What could I do? He tried, you know, bless him, he tried. He thought, right, I'm going to really try and hurt them, and he did, he hurt them. And here comes uh, Alexander Sasha Legkov across the line there. He was always there or thereabout, but he just doesn't have the gears to do this. Well, there it is, only his second Skiathlon World Cup win. He goes to Canada now. He's added the 100 points, plus uh, whatever he's accumulated on those uh, sprints. We'll get to that in a moment, and we'll be back to wrap up this Skiathlon when we come back after this. Well, uh, Mike, I think some better, happier news for Andrew Musgrave. 18th, he's deep. sadly uh, the, the pack were there and a number of them got ahead of him in the last stages but 2.18 behind, 18th position, he's got to be happy with that, uh, his recent form maybe didn't indicate that he was going to produce that today so uh, another great performance, top 20 in World Cup cross country ski racing is, is a good performance. Yeah that will help his FIS ranking as well but I think most importantly uh, for me, uh, he's going to get a boost uh, going into Canada. Now, Andrew Young, uh, he, you know, Andrew Young yesterday... Tenth you know, position. Yeah. Really good in sprint racing terms. So, and get Callum Smith today sadly uh, pulled out of the race early on. But three happy Norwegians uh, in the lead there. And uh, in fact, five the first home. And uh, you can see these are big gaps coming through. Sunby 1.10.03, that's a quick time. <sighs> it's amazing. What do you have to do to beat the uh, Sunby? Sunby wasn't in top form today, and that's why he was so happy to get this win. He had to uh, adopt another strategy. He had to be patient and relentlessly, slowly grind everyone else down. But the thing about the Norwegians all the way through, whether it's women or men, consistent. What does the rest of the world have to do to, to get in there? Um, the Swedes are, are really not at the races anymore. They used to threaten. Helner today, uh, I think it was 15th position, best of the Swedes. Not many even at the races. So uh, the country that used to threaten the Norwegians, not, uh, not taking part much. And we thought Heiken and, uh, might do something today. Well, I don't know whether uh, a lot of them thought, uh, OK, uh, we did the World Championships in Finland last year, like the Swedes. They really built up for that. They focused on that. We can't sustain that level. This year, we'll just soften it off a bit. And, uh, you know, we'll build up to next year in Lati and then to Korea for the Olympic Games. But, you know, when you get somebody stamping their authority, in this case, when you get a country stamping their authority on the rest of the world in respect to their sport... Right, Johnson, congratulations. Second it's amazing. Second win this season, 12th uh, in, all, in, in the whole season. Amazing performance, great race. Yeah, it was good. And we had a good uh, team spirit today. We, we need to come back from uh, <laughs> three Russian victories uh, last week, and uh, we were pretty mad about that. So today we, we had a talk last night, and we were going to, to fight back today, and it was good, five best. We are really happy, and for me, for sure, it was a good pre-championships and, uh, and uh, a good race. Monifica did a lot of work, uh, especially in the, in the classic part, but you, in the second skate lap, just went from the stadium. Plan executed as you uh, expected. Yeah, it was good. I, I was hoping to be able to do a bit more job uh, when Monifica uh, worked there, but uh, I had a quite big crash in the second lap of the classic, so... I needed some time to recover after that, uh, a bit painful actually, so uh, yeah, he did a good job and the French guys has, has shown also this season to be a good team, so all my credits to him and uh, I'm sorry that we, that we left him in the last two laps. You know, we have to be sorry about winning, but congratulations again. Thank you. He does really see himself, doesn't he, Mike, <laughs> as the captain of the Norwegian team. Here is the well, full uh, rundown. And I think what also is interesting about Martin Jonsrudsen, he alluded to the fact that in Falun last Saturday, mm. um, that uh, actually there was no Norwegian on the podium. And we were saying, well, when, when did that last happen? So and, and, they, look, and look at the importance of it. We're wondering what the rest of the world have to do. Well, they, they realized, well, we didn't win last weekend. We need to turn it around. Their desire to win is maybe just that, that much stronger than the rest. Yeah, they worked this out. They had a game plan individually and collectively, and they executed. 
And uh, yeah, just confirmation there of uh, Andrew Musgrave. Yeah, 18th position, uh, and uh, what was that? 218 behind, I think. Yeah, I, mean, I feel good for him, and hopefully he feels good for that. I mean, he'd probably be a bit annoyed that uh, uh, Pedro Norto got back in front of him again, but uh, nonetheless, uh, probably uh, just the, the, the tank emptying, and you've got one or two of those fast finishers, you know, coming through uh, from behind, and, and that's really what, you know, called him out. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, good World Cup points. And this is how it started uh, some, what, 70 minutes ago. The Norwegians charging out of the stadium, but this was on the freestyle leg with Sundby really setting out what he wanted to do. Tell you what, Mike, uh, they might not do it, but maybe they ought to change the colour of their suits for next season so nobody will recognise them. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll recognise them by the fact that no matter what colour suit, they'll be at the front. And an interesting, uh, Sumbi felt that, you know, he needed to have a good experience here to carry that positive feeling into the World Championships 22nd uh, February next year to the 5th of March. Well, what you... Uh have to say is that you just have to sit back and admire these uh, really talented cross-country skiers. They've got a club system in their country like no other. They've got a reservoir of talent like no other. But uh, they, are, they are a force, a tour de force, both in the men's and women's divisions. So, one or two latecomers coming home. And just a quick reminder that uh, still to come, wind permitting, the individual ski jumping on the big hill, and also the conclusion of the Nordic combined. Affected by the wind this morning, so they use the provisional competition round from earlier in the week to set up the cross-country race but it's valid and uh, Patrick and Mike will be your host for that decision so little chance to get a a little finish lunch which in this part of the world is called Koskan Korova or <laughs> cross-country um, vodka, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly is. You see the uh, flags at the end there. It's, uh, it's a distance away from the ski jumping hill, and of course it's lower, but uh, slightly encouraging news there. They're fairly still on the poles. You can just see one or two of them uh, still moving in the background there. So, Mike... Uh, Teresa Johan, Martin Jonsrud, Sunbi, final thoughts? Well, in terms of Sunbi, he really had to work harder today for this victory, and, and it meant a lot to him. Just uh, under five seconds. Therese Johan, well, she's head and shoulders above the rest. Destroyed them early in the classic stage and maintained that momentum through into the freestyle. And just a word on those yellow cards you can see there. Those will all be carried forward to Canada and the Tour of Canada, which is really next almost next on the menu now for the cross-country skiers gets going in march for 12 days tuesday the first of march however for the moment for mike dixon and myself uh, thank you for your company thank you for watching enjoy the rest of your afternoon hopefully with the nordic combined and the ski jumping uh, here in lati for now though bye-bye from finland <laughs>